The F-35 Joint Strike Fighter was billed as the most deadly of all fighter planes. You think of those F-35s as sort of a, a hunting pack of, of animals. But the hunter has become the hunted. Every aspect of that airplane is basically a failure waiting to happen. Is the JSF really worth the billions of dollars we're set to pay? Welcome to Four Corners. There's nothing new for Australian taxpayers in ordering up big weapons purchases and then seeing big budget blowouts, big delays and sometimes big disappointments. The F-35 Joint Strike Fighter could be the granddaddy debacle of them all. John Howard as Prime Minister signed Australia up to the F-35 development program in a secret deal with the American manufacturer Lockheed Martin in a Washington hotel 10 years ago. On paper, the plane must have seemed irresistible. The plan was to buy a hundred of them. Delivery was due to start flowing just about now. In reality, cost and delivery have blown out dramatically and credible experts believe the plane will never do what its makers promised. In Washington, doubts have been raised about the future of the whole project. Air defence is Australia's number one priority. The JSF is the biggest weapons purchase in our history and taxpayers might well end up paying $35 billion for a fleet of these so-called stealth fighters. Yet surprisingly for a project of this scale, there has been very little public debate or scrutiny. For tonight's report, Andrew Fowler went looking for answers. the coast of Florida, the United States Air Force is putting an extraordinary aircraft through its paces. The concept of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter is nothing short of breathtaking. A plane that's designed to strike first with an armoury of missiles and bombs, and most importantly, never be seen. A deadly combination of stealth and firepower. Self-control, we show good numbers, cleared left, full power. Its sensors give the pilot all-round vision of enemy activity on the ground and in the air, both day and night, sharing that picture with every other F-35 in the sky. Airplane 1 can send targeting information to Airplane 4's weapons, and that weapon can go off and hit something. You think of those F-35s as sort of a, a hunting pack of, of animals, a wolf pack, whatever you want to call that. There aren't other airplanes that are doing it like F-35 does. And it's even got a weapon that's a closely guarded secret. Those are the crown jewels of the program, uh, and that's what makes the F-35 special. So selling that to the public, it's really saying trust us. Well, it, it ultimately comes down to trust on all of this, doesn't it? <laughs> but there's little trust for the world's most expensive and controversial military program from a host of critics around the globe. So we have an airplane that can't turn to escape fighters, can't turn to escape missiles, sluggish in acceleration because it's so big and fat and draggy and doesn't have enough motor for the weight. My prediction is the airplane will become such an embarrassment that it will be cancelled before 500 airplanes are built. And with Australia, one of the biggest potential customers for the Joint Strike Fighter, it's drawing plenty of flack here as well. They've produced an aircraft that is not going to do the job. Clearly, it's not competitive, even with aircraft that are in our region today, let alone those that are coming down the pipe. On the Gulf of Mexico at Florida's Eglin Air Force Base, the next generation of pilots is being taught to fly the Joint Strike Fighter. The US 
US Air Force has plans for more than a thousand F-35 Joint Strike Fighters to take over its frontline combat duties, replacing its aging F-16 strike aircraft. It's been said that all pilots love new planes, and Lieutenant Colonel Lee Clues is no different, seeing the F-35's praises even before he left the cockpit. So what's it like to, to fly it? How do, you, how do you describe it? Well, besides a thrill, a minute. Down on the ground, Colonel Clues is only too pleased to talk about the F-35. Hello. Thanks for the flying. Yeah, sure. How would you describe it? How is it to, uh, to fly? I, I think the feeling many of us will describe is powerful. It, you know, particularly, again, coming from an F-16, you get this race car kind of feel. You know, you're strapped in an F-16, feels like this, this little rocket. But you feel this thing, it's, uh, you feel much bigger, the size of it, but the, the thrust that comes out of this engine and the acceleration you get from it, the rumble, it's just, uh, it's just quite a different feel. But it's also top secret. Some parts of this aircraft can't be filmed, as the Defence Department PR who chaperoned us around the base was quick to point out. And we can keep, keep going? Uh, we got this thing oh, again. Oh, sorry. Yep, OK. OK, we could probably just stay away from the back end then. OK. And make, probably get at an angle that way. OK. I'll start with you. Here. Here. The nice thing about it is every aircraft... The F-35 has other things to hide and they've got nothing to do with national security. Colonel Clues gives a hint of what some see as serious design flaws in the aircraft as he compares the F-35 with the F-16, one of the planes it's due to replace. Right now it's very stable. I, again, we're somewhat limited, so it's almost, it's not uh, fair to directly compare, but it's very smooth. It's what you would expect. There are no surprises when we do it. Yeah, because there are a few things to sort out, right, along the way. Oh, absolutely. And I think as the envelope increases and operational test is up and running, those are things that they'll sort out. That's pilot speak for an undeniable truth. Even though pilots are being trained to fly it, after nearly two decades in development, the F-35 is a multi-billion dollar high-tech war machine that's not ready for war. You'd never know it out here, but the plane is riddled with bugs. It's not flying supersonic. Its computers are operating at nowhere near full capacity. And it's restricted on how tightly it can turn because of G-force pressures. We haven't even scratched the surface of the failures because we've done all the easy flight testing so far, the hard flight testing. You know, that's all in front of us. That hasn't been done yet. Pierre Spray was part of the Pentagon's so-called fighter mafia, who challenged orthodox aircraft design to produce the F-16. If the Secretary of the Air Force had known we were sitting in his office, he'd have thrown our ass out. <laughs> we were public enemy number one in the Air Force for having inflicted this little cheap airplane on them. Despite those misgivings, the F-16 went on to be the backbone of the US Air Force for 30 years. How would the F-35 go up against the plane it's supposed to replace, the F-16? <laughs> it's an almost ludicrous comparison, and it's sad. I'm terrifically saddened that an airplane that we started working on in 1968 is so much better than an airplane that we won't have in service until 2018 or 2020. The F-16 would shred the F-35 on any mission you care to mention. So this is the A model version of the F-35. We have the a It's not a view shared by Lockheed Martin's chief test pilot for the F-35. He's flown more than 3,000 hours in the F-16 and knows both planes well. It's an incredibly nimble airplane and incredibly responsive, almost tight, if you will, to my commands to the airplane. So from that perspective, it's a very, very good handling airplane. How the plane performs is one thing, but how much it costs is certainly a big problem. In Washington, frustration in the Congress has become palpable as the price of the program 
has skyrocketed. So we started this program in 1995, and we're going to get a plane delivered in 2012. It occurs to me that we went to the moon faster than developing this plane. In a nutshell, the Joint Strike Fighter program has been both a scandal and a tragedy. Winslow Wheeler is a veteran military analyst who's charted the soaring costs of the JSF. Anybody paying attention to this airplane knew it was going to be a disaster from the very beginning. From the early 1990s, we started seeing public warnings in the mid-1990s. Um, this airplane has high cost and low performance in its DNA. It was designed into the airplane. It's going to die a slow, agonizing death in this country. There's a growing feeling in Washington that the future of the Joint Strike Fighter is as gloomy as the weather. With the axe about to fall on US defense spending, the world's most expensive military contract has become a big target. According to US government figures, over the past decade, the estimated cost of developing the Joint Strike Fighter rocketed from 34.4 billion US dollars to 55.2 billion, a jump of more than 60%. And the cost of the JSF program as a whole jumped from 233 billion to 395.7 billion, a whopping 70% rise. On the banks of Washington's Potomac River is the headquarters of the Pentagon's Joint Strike Fighter project team. Right now, because of the F-35's technical problems, it's more than five years late and way over budget. And I'll be bringing you into the front office of the Joint Strike Fighter where my office is. And Lieutenant General Chris Bogdan is in charge. And this is our front office area. We're the first television crew to be granted such open access to the inner workings of the Joint Strike Fighter team. And it's the first television interview Lieutenant General Bogdan has given since he took over the job last year. He doesn't hold back about what's wrong. Well, let's make no mistake about it. Um, this program still has risks, technical risks. Um, it has cost issues. It has problems that we have to, in the future, fix. The good news there is that each and every lot of airplanes has cost less than the previous lot. And I expect and will demand that the future lots will continue on that trend to cost less and less. We are coming into the Joint Strike Fighter War Room. General Bogdan has a reputation as a Mr. Fix-It. He's made difficult US defense programs work in the past. This one has come with added complexity. The F-35 isn't a simple aircraft built for a single task. It's a three-in-one fighter. For the Marines, it needs to vertically take off and land. The Air Force requires a conventional plane. And the Navy, a version that can operate from an aircraft carrier. General Bogdan admits with such a high degree of complexity, there were always bound to be problems. Nothing is easy in the acquisition world. And the airplanes we're building today are incredibly sophisticated. The back end of the airplane, the exhaust nozzle, tilts downward. But just as big a problem, which has dogged the program, has an ugly name. It's called concurrency, and it means the aircraft is flown and in production well before being properly tested. Concurrency has created a complexity in this, pro in this program um, that we have to deal with today. Um, and while I would not dare to go back and criticize the decisions that were made in the past, um, what I probably would have thought about was how much development work and how much testing was really done to solidify the design of the airplane before we started producing airplanes. 
a large amount of concurrency, i.e. beginning production long before your design is stable and long before you've found problems in test, creates downstream issues where now you have to go back and retrofit airplanes and make sure that the production line has those fixes in them. And, and that drives complexity and cost. And has that, well that has happened to you. Oh, without Concurrency has caused a problem. Uh, without a doubt. All airplanes built under this rubric of concurrency wind up way short of their goals. What people say to themselves, Air Force people who are you know, looking to buy them or to fly them say, well, even if it falls somewhat short, it'll be so much better than anything else, we still want it. Lockheed Martin recognized that this technically ambitious aircraft would only be profitable if enough was sold to keep the price down. Its sales machine went into overdrive. The F-35 Joint Strike Fighter is a highly diversified fifth generation tactical aircraft designed to excel in the air interdiction environment. By early 2000, Lockheed Martin had guaranteed commitments from the US and British governments. There was growing interest from Norway, Italy, Denmark, Turkey, the Netherlands and Canada. But Lockheed Martin needed to sell more planes, many more. Australia was a prime target. The air combat capability is the single most important capability for the defence of Australia and the reason for that is very straightforward. In Australia, Hugh White, then Deputy Secretary of Defence, had just written a white paper which mapped out Australia's future air defences. Well, what we, what we knew was that the aircraft we had were going to run out of life. The problem is that replacing those aircraft uh, required us to make a choice from a very limited range of, of options. Uh, there are not very many frontline combat aircraft on the market. And we didn't at that stage have to decide what aircraft to buy, but we did have to decide what kind of range of aircraft we needed to consider. Tasked with finding a replacement for the fabled F-111 fighter bomber, Australian defence officials began assessing aircraft on offer from manufacturers around the world. The Joint Strike Fighter was still a it was a developed project, but it was still a gleam in the eye as far as actual delivered capability was concerned. And we were much less clear about how much it was going to cost and so on. The key decision we made in the 2000 white paper process was to leave open the option of going for the Joint Strike Fighter as a fifth generation combat aircraft. But Four Corners can reveal that rather than just leaving the option open, the RAAF's top brass had already made up their minds. A former defence official closely involved in the oversight of the replacement program agreed to talk to us on condition that we protect his identity. He says the decision to join the JSF program was taken without the aircraft ever being fully tested and that the then head of the RAAF, Air Marshal Angus Houston, was seemingly swayed by the enthusiasm of his US counterpart. He told several people at the time that the chief of the US Air Force had said this was the right aeroplane for Australia. And so Angus thought that was the correct answer, that this was the right, the right aircraft for us. What do you think of that thinking? Well, it's an interesting approach. Um, it certainly uh, speeded up the decision-making process. As I said, normally we would have gone through um, a competitive tendering process and worked out what the aeroplane could do, what its cost and its schedule was. Now we were proposing that we'd buy something being developed for the US Air Force if you like, um, on, a, on a whim. In a statement to Four Corners, Angus Houston said, the system design and development phase was non-binding and the Australian government could opt out if it so wished. Armed with this recommendation from the head of the RAAF, on June the 11th, 2002, the then Prime Minister John Howard arrived in Washington on an official visit. We're delighted and honored to have a delegation from Australia headed by the distinguished Prime Minister John Howard. And we but John Howard also had a far less public meeting to attend. Just around the corner from the White House at the Willard Hotel, he sat down with representatives of Lockheed Martin. 
At this secret meeting, John Howard signed up Australia to the JSF program. In the meantime, other aircraft companies were preparing to go head to head for a lucrative Australian contract. The huge French aircraft manufacturer Dassault pitched its frontline fighter, the Rafale. In Paris, Dassault's representative, Daniel Fremont, prepared for the upheaval of moving to Australia for a five year campaign to sell the French plane. Australia had declared that they wanted a, a lot of aircraft. And that's, we, were, we were talking about 100 aircraft. So uh, it's very likely that Australia will be the, the biggest or one of the biggest customers. Uh, and I think this is why that was really a, a very important uh, competition for everybody. On June 27, 2002, just 16 days after Howard's secret meeting in Washington, Primon arrived in Canberra, unaware of the meeting between John Howard and Lockheed. The Dassault representative had barely driven in from the airport when he received a call. The then Defence Minister, Senator Robert Hill, was giving a press conference. What we're announcing today is that we've decided to, as a government, to participate in the system development and demonstration phase of the Lockheed Martin Joint Strike Fighter. And ultimately, this, this will be the largest military procurement in, uh, in Australia's history. I was so uh, shocked that uh, I could not believe it. That's just as simple as that. The Howard government had decided to completely abandon the decades-long practice of a considered tendering process and put its money on a paper plane. I think Howard himself was pretty keen on this. I think Howard was keen on it as a demonstration of Australia's support for the United States. For Lockheed Martin, it was a major win. That must have surprised you, even with all of your experience in plane making and plane selling, that uh, that was an extraordinary win. Andrew, our view was that the Australian government made a very wise decision. The really scary part about the Lockheed Martin marketing strategy was that they were able to get people in the departments and ministries of defence around the Western world they actually got those people to do their marketing for them. And by having people in the departments and ministries of defence doing the marketing, it was an easy way of getting a decision early. And that's what they achieved. Within weeks, the then Defence Minister, Senator Robert Hill, visited the Lockheed plant in Texas. The closest he got to understanding what the F-35 might be able to do was to sit in the cockpit of a plastic mock-up. <laughs> it was good advice, advice Hill could have taken himself. But it seems no one was being cautious, least of all the Australian government. Yet Canberra wasn't alone in the way it made its decision to choose the F-35. The Government of Canada is committing today to acquire 65 Joint Strike Fighter F-35 Lightning II aircraft to meet the security challenges of the 21st century. This, yes. Our investment is valued at approximately $9 billion. I remember quite uh, vividly that Friday afternoon on July 16th when the government made the announcement that it was going to buy this jet without any competition. And the, the word leaked beforehand, but I was actually just shocked. Alan Williams lives in Canada, but he's spending the winter here in Florida. You know, when you live in a democracy, you have to ensure that the democracy functions. He was the most senior civilian officer in Canadian defence procurement when the government was deciding which combat aircraft to buy to replace its ageing fleet. At the beginning, they quoted a figure of about $9 billion to buy these jets and $7 billion to, to, to maintain or operate for them, so a total of 16. 
Now, anybody involved in the business knows going in that the cost to operate and sustain um, is usually two to three times the cost to buy. So right away, anybody in the business knows that that made no sense whatsoever. Williams decided to speak out publicly because he was angry that the JSF had been chosen without any detailed comparison with other aircraft. I couldn't believe that the government was going to spend money on an aircraft that was in the embryonic stages of development whose costs were unknown. I was even more surprised to hear them go on um, spinning the information, best jet at the best price. Um, we're going to get great industrial benefits. We need it for interoperability. All these reasons that I knew factually were not true. National Defence did not exercise the diligence that would be expected in managing a $25 billion commitment. Amid a growing political storm over its JSF deal, last year Canada's Auditor General concluded that the true cost of buying 65 Joint Strike Fighters was actually $25 billion, not the $16 billion figure cited by the government. Government shouldn't make you know, these kind of nonsensical decisions without hard facts when they're going to be spending your or my hard-earned money. It's still not clear how much each aircraft will cost if Australia goes ahead and orders 100 Joint Strike Fighters. Back in 2002, Defence Minister Senator Robert Hill gave his own estimate. What are these things going to cost? Per aircraft, yes. well, that's that's not known at the moment, but uh, at the, it is believed to be in the vicinity of about 40 million, uh, 40 million US per aircraft. That's 54 million dollars in today's figures, allowing for inflation. According to the Australian Auditor General, the price of the planes has doubled. They're now estimated to cost $130 million each. There are lots of uncertainties built into the price. But having said that, um, you know, take a stab, these things are going to cost us $150 million bucks each and they're going to cost us another $200 million bucks each to operate through their, through their lives. So that means a fleet of 100, it'll cost you $15 billion bucks to buy and $20 billion bucks to operate. $35 billion bucks is an awful lot of money. One of the really significant mistakes the government has made in the way it's managed the Joint Strike Fighter question, really going back a decade when the decision was made, has been their reluctance to talk about how much the aircraft is going to cost. At Fort Worth in Texas, where the planes are being built, there's still a hint of the Wild West <laughs> and the cowboys that went with it. Just up the road at Lockheed Martin's plant, they have the flags out for those who have faith in the company. Last year, Lockheed Martin appointed a new general manager of the F-35 program, Orlando Cavallo. Our key objective, Andrew, is to perform. Our key objective is to deliver this airplane, this F-35 airplane, with the full capability. And Just a I week said, before this interview, a US Defense Department review of the aircraft found further flaws, including the fact that the F-35, which Lockheed Martin has named the Lightning II, is restricted from flying too close to electrical storms. So Andrew, lightning protection is a good example of the type of normal discovery that you're gonna find as you execute a development and test program. Now you, you call the plane the F-35 Lightning II. The report says the plane can't fly within 25 miles of a lightning storm because of the possibility it might ignite the oxygen in the fuel tanks. True statement, but let's put the context on, on that scenario. We we'll have airplanes in the field that we know should not be flying around lightning. Will this problem occur in the future? 
No, because we have the known fixes for it and we will fix it. But today, you're absolutely right. The airplane cannot fly in lightning. Um, in the future, will it be able to? Absolutely. The Pentagon has been forced to lower the bar for the aircraft's performance, including a slower acceleration and turning rate, so it can meet its specifications. Former RAAF flight test engineer Peter Goon says such problems are symptomatic of a whole host of potentially serious defects in the F-35. The aircraft is not coming within a bull's roar of its specification. It's also riddled with what we call single points of failure, where if something fails, um, there's a high probability you lose the aircraft. This is our um, electrical optic targeting system, t flare that's in the nose. The heart of the Joint Strike Fighter is its high-tech computerised cockpit. There's not a dial or a knob anywhere to be seen. I've already set up a target for air-to-air -air and air surface, but you also... They've all been replaced by iPhone-style touchscreens, a digital aircraft for a new generation of flyers. Yeah, there you go, excellent. Put it right in the middle of it. So we're gonna go in and drop a bomb on the edge of the hangar. Press that red bomb switch right there, our pickle switch. Behind these video displays lies millions of lines of computer software code. It's here that the latest U.S. Defense Department report points to ongoing problems. This is a very software-intensive airplane. Um, there's over 10,000 lines of software code just on the airplane itself, and there's another 10 million lines of code for all the offboard systems, the maintenance systems, and the mission planning systems that go with it. So it, it is unprecedented to have an airplane with that much software. And software is a very, very tricky thing. Because of the enormous complexity, every aspect of that airplane is basically a failure waiting to happen, and super hard to fix. The computer system is a nightmare, and they're so behind schedule, they're more behind schedule on software than on anything else. In nearby Dallas, Lockheed Martin is facing legal claims that the JSF's vital computer systems were fundamentally flawed right from the start. The biggest problem, I think, from all I've looked at through these years is getting the truth to percolate to the top. Sam Boyd is a former Special Forces Green Beret. Now he's involved in a legal battle over serious allegations of software failure on the F-35. He's got Lockheed Martin in his sights. I'm not a software expert, but I'm expert enough to understand that if the system is not communicating, uh, like in this instance, you have a crash, a software crash, that's really bad when it's an airplane that depends on active uh, digital communications in a software system. It crashes. The case involves Sylvester Davis, a computer software manager recruited by Lockheed Martin to work on the F-35 in the early stages of development. The best way I would describe that is if you have an automobile, if your tail light doesn't work, then there is some potential safety impact to that not working. If your brakes don't work at all, then that's what we would call safety evidence assure level one because there is a safety impact to that failure. Uh, all the software being developed in the flight control application environment is the highest level of safety criticality, which is called safety, level, safety evidence assure level one. And is that the area that you found problems in? Yes, sir, that is correct. Davis says that during lab testing in November 2004, the flight control software crashed completely, a failure which would have had a catastrophic impact during an actual flight. So what effect would that have for the pilot flying the plane? Since this is the flight control software which you're talking about, if the system goes down, there is no control of the aircraft. So you might as well be a rock in space. You can't do anything. Davis says that when he reported the issue, he received an award for his diligence. But there was a catch. They give me this award. The award was $10,000. As they're giving me this award, it was said to me in that meeting, we would like you to accept an immediate transfer to this other department. What did you think of that? 
I viewed that as a way to move me out of the way because I was a problem. And it says here in the document that... In the end, Davis left Lockheed Martin concerned that the computer problem was never properly fixed. Now he wants compensation from the company for what happened to him. One of your computer managers has a, a current court case with you, with Lockheed Martin. Yeah, Davis Andrew, I, Davis. Um, I'm not going to... I'm not going to comment on, on, uh, on that item. But you are aware of the, of the case? Yes, but I'm not going to comment on the item. Why not? It's not appropriate. We're discussing computer software programming. He's someone who's, who's saying that you got it wrong in the beginning and that's why you're having problems now. I think it's a relevant question to ask you. Andrew, if you want to ask me, are we having problems in the software development, that I can answer. And the answer is that our software development is proceeding along our expectations, along what we had planned to do. Others argue that if it ever goes into battle, the JSF will face even bigger problems than computer software. If you watch the screen, any time you see a flash, it's a missile going off. You'll see a star. Retired wing commander Chris Mills is a former air warfare strategist in the Australian Defence Department. Using computer simulations, he demonstrates how the F-35 would fare in combat against its likely foes, Russian-built Sukhois, also known as flankers. This is an example of the end game. The JSS are out of ammunition, they're out of fuel, they're heading for home. They've got no choice but present their rear ends to the, um, to the flankers. The flankers can see them on infrared, they can see them on radar, they've got fuel, they've got weapons. So they just run them down and kill them. Now he's wargaming the plane for his own company as a private consultant. But he says the outcome is the same. Here we've seen another JSF has just died. In this scenario involving an air battle against the Chinese version of the Sukhois, only one of the 24 JSFs survive. OK, what have we got here? This is the loss of the USA. Both of the, the, of the AWAC sentries, all of the tankers, and 23 of the 24 JSFs. Now, this is a particularly bad day at off, so they don't usually lose quite that many. Mills has repeated the war game exercise several times. Each time, it's a similar story. 240 jo Joint Strike Fighters went out over those 10 missions and 35 came home. So that's not quite annihilation, but it's a very savage defeat. But both the US and Australian Air Forces argue that without access to the F-35 secrets, mm -hmm. Mills does not have the full picture. I think that the Air Power Aus Australia and Rep Sims analysis is basically flawed through incorrect assumptions and a lack of knowledge of the classified F-35 performance information. It's a lame excuse for a very bad airplane. And by the way, if you were building a good airplane and you had super secret stuff that really worked, you could put it on a good airplane. Why would you want to put it on a bad airplane? And you've got a terrible airplane here. I tell you it is a formidable airplane. I have no doubt if you went head to head with this airplane, with any other airplane in the world, with the capabilities that I know it has, it will do very, very well. You can argue endlessly about the capability of the aircraft, but the fact is, it's very late. And Australia has already spent billions of dollars to plug the gap. In 2007, the government spent more than $6 billion buying 24 Super Hornets. Now it's considering buying another 24. Defence Minister Stephen Smith declined to be interviewed for this program. But at a media conference late last year, he hinted that Australia was close to abandoning the idea of a fleet consisting solely of JSFs. I think it's now become clear to all uh, that the Super Hornets are potentially much more than simply a transition fleet. If you then have a combination or a mix of fleets, then one implication is potentially uh, the acquisition of a smaller number of joint strike fighters because the decision... A mixed fleet is exactly what was recommended to the RAAF hierarchy a decade ago, an idea it resisted. 
We get the Super Hornets early on and then the JSFs later when the aircraft actually was suitable and entered service. And what was the response to that? Oh, Angus was, uh, was not pleased about that idea at all. His uh, comment or something was uh, the government would not like that. So he was uh, very What do you keen. think he meant by that? Well, he's very keen to have uh, a single aircraft type only. Um, and he had a belief perhaps that single aeroplane type was, uh, was lower cost to operate, but he was just uh, enamoured of the idea of having uh, the Joint Strike Fighter only. He uh, did not wish to have a mixed fleet again. In a statement to Four Corners, Angus Houston did not specifically address this claim, but he did state, I am still convinced that the JSF is the right air combat aircraft to meet Australia's future security needs. It's not just Australia pulling back from its original plans. Canada is now reconsidering whether to buy the F-35 at all. So is the Netherlands. Cash-strapped Italy has cut back its order. In response, Lockheed Martin is pushing its plane harder than ever, stressing its interoperability with coalition partners. Lockheed Martin's marketing strategy is basically designed to enable Lockheed Martin to rape, plunder and pillage taxpayers around the Western world for the next 40 to 50 years. The way the aircraft's designed requires people to go back to Lockheed Martin, go back to the contractors if they want to do, do any changes. I'd like to point uh, your attention to our production wall. General Bogdan is in a bind. It's a high-risk strategy. He promises there'll be no more delays and the price will come down. But he doesn't rule out that some of the aircraft's capability may have to be sacrificed, and that will affect sales. If you promise that you're getting a Ferrari and you deliver a Chevy, um, no offense to the Chevy company, um, you're, you're not going to sell as many. It's as simple as that. And if you don't sell as many, then the price goes up. Sure, it's, it's, a, it's a death spiral. It's a, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, economic model in that if you have problems on the airplane, it costs you more. If it costs you more, you won't sell more airplanes. If you don't sell more airplanes, the cost goes up, so you can't buy as many airplanes, and it's, it's sort, of a, so, sort of a circular, perpetual kind of thing. It's kind of a death spiral. I don't think that's the case on this program. It's said by General Brogdon that uh, he describes it as the uh, orders going down, the price going up, it being a death spiral. Yeah, I think we would agree with that. If, that, if those circumstances were to happen, if all of a sudden the demand for the airplane were to drop off, and the price were to go up, then it would become it would, be, it would be very difficult to be affordable. More than 10 years after the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter appeared as a paper plane and billions of dollars of development money later, the aircraft is still not fit to fight a war. It's bad enough that so much money has been wasted. What is just as bad for countries like Australia is that the plane that the Western Allies place so much faith in has so far failed to deliver. And there are serious questions about whether it ever will. Just one year ago, senior Lockheed Martin executive Tom Burbage came to Australia and assured the Parliamentary Defence Committee that the F-35 was meeting or exceeding its performance requirements. What's that assurance worth now? As mentioned, neither the Minister for Defence nor his department would speak to Four Corners, but you can read the full statement from the former head of the Armed Forces, Air Chief Marshal Angus Houston, on our website. Next week on Four Corners, the terrible cost of alcohol fueled violence that police, paramedics and doctors are saying has reached crisis point. Until then, good night.